all this come all this is coming down to like just a big setup for your dad joke that's <laughs> fantastic fantastic it that uh, and it won't be about the weather although maybe it should be i think summer is winds. <laughs> i think we, we are in the throes of uh of summer and uh you know all the smoke from canada you got your air quality issues and uh, i know we'll talk surveys uh here in the in the cast but uh that idea of being a fall league imagine practice right now sean <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah exactly well uh I guess let's kick things off. Like, good morning. How are you doing? Yeah, doing doing pretty good. Just uh, trying to beat the heat, you know, planning uh, my rides deliberately. <laughs> Early morning, maybe late evening. Uh, yeah. It's gotten, uh, a little steamy out there. I've gotten sucked into uh, another uh, cycle of doing trail work, like lots of trail work during the, the days. Um, something that Golden and I both, like last year we ended up, Oh, we worked. We worked pretty solid for about four to five weeks to build uh, gravity progressive jump lines at our local trail. And it was one of those where like we get up really early in the morning and go out like, OK, we're going to go out whenever it's cool. And we would work until it started getting too warm to comfortably work. And right as we were like, OK, it's, it's time to knock it off. The trail builder we had hired would call and say, I'm on my way. I'll be there in 30 minutes. I'm going to need help today. And whenever he would show up, that was like, you were working for solid six hours. Like that was just no. So we were, we were like just trying to beat the heat, but then we would still get sucked into the heat. So this year we don't have any of that, but we're still having to do some major projects like replace a bridge and things like that. So that's some serious trail work. Most of the <laughs> trail work we've done out East here is, you know, those spring rains bring everything green and then everything starts growing into the trail. And so we, I call it a haircut. You know, you got to go down the trail, yeah. just give everything a nice trim uh, to yeah. cut it back. Yeah. Yesterday we were pulling the posts from the original bridge and um, one of, one of my coaches, he uh, was is spearheading heading this project and he has this like Boy Scout background, plus he's a firefighter. And he had rigged up this A-frame with a like all these complicated knots and had a pulley system. And like we basically winched these these posts out. And I was just thinking yesterday, like, if that had been me doing it on my own, I would have just been out there with a shovel, like uh hating life and trying to dig these things up. And what he did and you know, just a few minutes of of winch work was invaluable. Uh time saved over putting a shovel in the dirt so it was nice to have it's always nice to have knowledge nice to have friends with skills yes agreed exactly and kind of that's a a very tortured setup for uh basically you know us to talk about the coming coach training season so uh dates are locked in I want to make sure everyone's aware that um, we have five weekends coming up starting with August 5th and 6th. Um, and these are all combined WFA, CPR, OTBS 101 training weekends. And the way they're going to work is on Saturday will be the in-person portion of the hybrid WFA CPR. And then on Sunday will be the OTBS 101. There are... 20 seats for the combined WFA CPR OTBS 101. And then there are an additional 12 seats of WFA CPR for those who need to recertify. And um, cost wise, we've worked really, really hard to get the cost down so that it's affordable. Unfortunately, it's not as inexpensive as we got it last year, but it's much more reasonable than um, any other WFA uh, offering that we've seen. So our combined WFA, CPR, and OTBS 101 is going to be about $185 if you register early, and then that will go up to $205 if you um, are kind of at the last moment doing it. And all the registrations are going to cut off a week uh, or excuse me, five days prior to the course because that online portion needs to be done. So that we can't do like register, register on Friday and show up on Saturday. You won't have done any of the, the work. So we want to make sure that we've got all of that. 
Um, but those dates are, and locations are going to be August 5th and 6th and August 12th and 13th. Those are both going to be in Asheville. Uh, September 16th and 17th and August 26th and 27th are both going to be in Raleigh. And then uh, September 30th and October 1st weekend, that's going to be in Fayetteville. So we've tried to do a Western, a Central, and an Eastern location for everyone. And in addition to that, we are going to have a league summit, and the date for that is going to be October 7th and 8th. Um, the location is to be determined. Um, Brian, I know you're putting some, some effort in on that part, uh, talking with a couple of people about locations. And one of the things that we're going to be looking at doing with League Summit, uh, something that people have been asking about is OTBS 201. So we will be offering at least one OTBS 201 during that, um, that weekend of League Summit. Yeah, I am shopping around for locations. I think let me talk a little bit about cost, which you brought up, and we will talk the end of season survey uh, in the cast. But that was one item, and I found it uh, kind of interesting across uh, coaches and parents. Uh, that was a specific question, their thoughts on costs. And mainly, you know, 80 some percent, 85 maybe thought costs were about right for participation in this league. Um, but I'm sensitive to some feedback I've gotten from coaches from my very first uh, league summit. In the fall, Sean, if you remember, coaches talked about uh, the expense of, of some of the training, particularly as you advance in levels. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're trying to keep those costs, particularly for the WFA and uh, CPR, as low as possible. The league is subsidizing uh, some of that cost. We're paying for the instructor's travel and lodging. So it's literally a direct cost of the course uh, to the coaches. Uh, so we're trying to to be um, you know diligent with our costs we pass on to the coaches, and that's the same thing with League Summit. Part of the shopping around is finding a venue that's uh, affordable uh, for the league, both convenient location but affordable. Uh, Rocky Mountain Mills last fall was awesome, great location. Uh, I'm not going to pay that much for food again. I don't think it was pr pr pretty pricey. Uh, so yeah, just trying to be a good steward of our resources here, and that's part of the the factors when we schedule uh, these type of things, Sean. And, and another thing too is, you know, we are really trying to shift over to everyone just having WFA um, as their first aid because by doing it just one time in this training uh, cycle for your level two, you're also ready to go on to level three if um, that's something that you want to pursue. But also given that, I think a lot of us don't even realize that even if we're riding a trail that's fairly close to where we live, we're probably still outside of that one hour to definitive care and outside of the realm of what normal first aid really covers. And, you know, especially out here in Western North Carolina, like it's very easy for us to be riding in a place that's just way outside of any kind of um, one hour to definitive care. And so making that, WFA kind of the de facto first aid that all coaches have we feel like it's it's a net positive for our student athletes like we're doing over and above kind of that that level of care that we want to see so that everyone's capable um, to handle whatever situation might arise on the trail and first aid wise and be able to deal with it accordingly and be able to do it in such a way that they can um, have that extended time for definitive care to, to arrive. So that's that's definitely um, one of the important things that we're looking for. But that being said, uh, whenever we offer these, when you go in to register, you are only going to see the option if you are wanting to take OTBS 101, that it's a combined WFA, CPR, OTBS 101. If you happen to already have WFA or you have some other advanced medical training that qualifies you to have that, um, in pit zone already covered, then let me know and we'll work with you on getting just the OTBS 101 portion. But for everyone else, we really are, it's WFA, CPR, OTBS 101, so that one weekend you've got everything covered. One of the things that coaches are always kind of coming and saying is that like, we need more OTBS 101, we need more OTBS 101, that that's the thing holding them back from having level two coaches, but it's two pieces otbs 101 is a big piece and that's one that we kind of have a lot of responsibility in dealing with but there's also this first aid and 
what I've seen is that a lot of times coaches are saying, I need more coaches trained in OTBS 101 so I can get more level twos. And they'll have plenty of coaches that have been through the OTBS 101 portion, but they never did first aid. So you're sitting on all these people that could be level two with just a first aid, but they're not. And so now the kind of the, the push is for us to train more in the OTBS 101, but it still falls short of getting you those level twos. So that's why these combined training weekends are really important so that we get you to where you know, like you've got somebody that all they need to do is a couple of online modules and they're level two. They've gotten all the big stuff out of the way. So that's why we're doing things the way that we're doing them in order to assist you in getting fully trained level two coaches that you can rely on. I think it might be important to mention too, you, Sean, are training, I think the last count upwards of five additional coach supporters. Uh, so as we do our standard practice in the late fall, early winter of doing those OTBS one-on-ones for new teams and offering extra seats, we're going to be able to offer uh, those a little bit more because we've got more coach supporters. So thanks for, uh, you know, building our bench of coach supporters and thanks for all that volunteer to do that. And that really is like, that's a pinch point. Like we can only do so much with so many people and so being able to get more people trained to be able to deliver that stuff but it, it's a it's a process you know it's something that uh none of this is rubber stamp like none of this is something that that i look at as like i just need to like rubber stamp somebody that they're a coach supporter so i can throw them out there so that they can train you so that you can rubber stamp that you've got otbs 101 so that you can have a level two like we want this to be quality because one of the things that we're seeing from our surveys feedback from student athletes is that they're not getting that level of skills training that they really feel like they need to have and that's important for us to think about as head coaches and team directors as we start planning our practices we don't want to fall into that cycle of just it's all about riding because we've got to be incorporating those skills. And even those kids that you think are great and that they themselves think are great, they, they've got things that they need to work on and they've got situations that you can stick them in to help them improve their skills. And it's one of those things that you see kind of constantly if you are following anybody on YouTube that does any kind of skills instruction, they're constantly saying like, you never get to a point to where you can't get better. And that's the thing that we want to be instilling in our student athletes is that being a student athlete, being an athlete in general is a process of constant betterment. So constantly improving. And there's no point that we get to, to where we're like, yeah, I'm good. I can do, I can do corners. Like I'm fine. I don't ever need to work on corners again. I'm as good as I'm ever going to get because then you're limiting yourself. And so that's the thing that we want to, to be aware of is that our student athletes are recognizing that they need more skills instruction and we want to accommodate that. So let's not look at this as just a hurdle or a hoop to jump through, but an actual integral part of what it is we do at this level of student athlete training for mountain biking. Those are great points, Sean, and I'm looking forward to getting refreshed as a coach supporter by you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we can we can have those good one-on-one uh, -on -one clinics, and I think it's it's a, it's a balance to what we also saw in the survey was uh, a desire for more uh, team building activities uh, as part of the practice. So incorporating skills and team building together for me, one of the best parts of the one-on-one -on -one clinic is honestly the short course. Uh, description and discussion and like, hey, take these skills and here's how to make them more challenging. Here's how to put them together. Here's how to make a practice interesting. That's really what we're doing uh, for our coaches is trying to help them build that environment where student athletes are uh, one challenge, they're improving their skills, but also feel like they're part of a team. And that came through loud and clear in the surveys as well. The desire for a little bit more of that uh, as well. So yeah, looking forward to this season of uh, coach training, Sean. Awesome. Well, what you got on the agenda for today? Like I'm scanning through and there's lots of things with your name by it. So let's, let's dive into it. You just got back from the league director conference with all the other league directors in NICA. And that was at Trek headquarters in Waterloo, Wisconsin. 
it, it was uh highly recommend to anyone if you're in wisconsin if you're around madison get up to waterloo and go visit <laughs> trek headquarters it's a phenomenal facility uh you can see why trek was just uh voted one of the top 100 places to work in the united states uh really nice facility they take care of their people up there and it was uh, very very good that they they hosted us there um, I think it, for the conference, yeah, the idea was uh, NICA brought together all the league directors uh, from across the nation. Uh, one, just to talk about where NICA is headed as an organization. Uh, and then two, the, the best benefit of uh, conferences like that to me is like I stole a ton of good ideas from other leagues. <laughs> you know, I was there to offer uh, some ideas on what North Carolina was doing, uh, but all the other leagues offered some things too. And I'll talk uh, briefly about those. But just in terms of where NICA is headed for uh, our audience here, um, getting a lot of great support from Trek. I think uh, some of our folks saw uh, a greater presence from Trek at our venues this previous season with the Hospitality Zone. Uh, talked in the last podcast about how they supported our senior recognition uh, for the season. And I think we'll see more of Trek. They are absolutely putting their money where their mouth is and getting more kids on bikes and providing support to, to all the league. So I got to talk about that. That was pretty cool uh, when you're talking in front of the Trek president about how Trek supported our senior recognition uh, plan for this season. That's one of the things I shared with their league directors. And the other was how we were trying to recognize some of our athletes uh, for uh, their character. I got to tell the story of Noah Droke, who's an athlete on the Downey's Dirt Dogs here in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Uh, this is a kid who, in uh, the second race at Dark Mountain, stopped his race to help a fellow student athlete uh, who had come off the bike and, and suffered an injury. And that's the type of character we absolutely want to uh, to build and encourage in the league. So how do we do that? Uh, Sean, I think this was uh, started with one of your your ideas about the race uh, plate stickers. And then Shell took that and developed some and like we started handing those out because we as a league, we can't catch all those uh, moments of awesome character. Right. But coaches can or the marshal can. Uh, and so let's recognize that. So I got to tell the the other league directors how we were doing that. And sure enough, they all asked for our templates and, you know, the plan and all that. But that, that's the value of NICO is uh, sharing just great ideas uh, across the nation. Uh, and Sean, you, you know, this is our chief referee. Uh, every now and then you have some positive sporting behavior issues. Uh, we'd like to encourage the good ones, you know, when, when we see it, let's recognize it. So that, that was, that was great to share. Uh, but let me talk a little bit about, uh, Trek and NICA and where they're, where they're headed. Um, Trek is really, uh, helping the, the entire association out with market analysis, uh, where don't we have kids on bikes and doing a state by state analysis of high school student athlete populations. And the thought right now, Sean, is for NICA writ large, uh, 25,000 some student athletes across the nation. Uh, that target number should be about 100,000 in, in Trek's mind. And that, that's a big goal. But when we take a look at the initial data for North Carolina, that's a three to 4,000 number here. And we're, what did we have last season? About 900 or so just just shy of 900 shy of 900 okay so i've i've got some work to do i've got to think through how we structure this league as either a chapter league into conferences east west um you know how to sustain uh and point towards that type of growth but it is possible based on the student population here and trek is going to help with that market analysis so uh incredibly beneficial uh, to tie this back to the last conversation, when you talk with uh, Dallin Attack, who's the league director in Utah, and he's got uh, upwards of 6,000 athletes out there, he says the key to that is coaches. The key to growth is coaches because coaches, they're going to attract the student athletes and keep them by good skills and team building. And they'll talk in the community and they'll encourage others to come out and say, hey, this is really fun. Uh, you're well supported uh, through the training and, and the like, and the league has a good atmosphere. That that's the the key to growth is the coaches. So just to tie it back to what you were talking about, Sean, you know, good instruction for our coaches, uh, supported by the coach supporters, I think is one of the ways we we do grow this league. So yeah, good opportunity to kind of tell what North Carolina was up to, but also steal a ton of those good ideas from other league directors, and uh, we will see some of those next season as uh, as we look to incorporate and change just a little bit of things of how we do business here in North Carolina. Yeah. And, and for me, you know, like I've, I've long realized that coaches are sort of the important piece and making sure that not only are we getting good quality coaches, but that we are encouraging coach longevity. So the amount of time in the league and trying to find ways to have uh, some specialization of coaching so that coaches can find the thing that they are passionate about and sort of continue on with that 
in like uh, within the league so that our kids are getting the benefit of that. And so those are sort of the longer term ideas that we've been working on for a few years of, of how we do that. And I think we're going to start to introduce some of that with um, the league summit and these ideas around adventure and um, TTC and those sorts of things. So I'm really excited to see like what Shell and the people that she's working with and the adventure and TTC programs are coming up with that goes along with what we've seen with grit and the, the idea behind like a grit coach and grit co coordinator and things like that. So I think all in all, like we're in kind of a really healthy place for building that coach cadre and um, increasing our longevity. But I was there in Bentonville when um, John Burke, the uh, president of Trek uh, talked about how, golf nationwide like youth golf has i think it's like 250,000 participants and like i don't hear any like there's like five kids in my high school that are excited about golf but there's way more kids in my high school that are excited about mountain biking so it's kind of like dumbfounded that that is literally like 10 times larger than nika just the, the youth golf in, in the United States. So we can certainly, I think, come up to that 100,000 uh, student athlete mark very, very quickly if we if we play our cards right. So 100% uh, agree on that goal. Uh, absolutely. And John Burke uh, spent a little bit of time with us. It was great. Like I said, putting your money where your mouth is, really caring about the organization when the president of Trek shows up to, to invest in you. That's a signal. So yeah, thanks to Trek, national uh, sponsor for NECA for all the support. And you want to roll into survey, 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 survey. This is all your show, man. This is, we, this we did. is all you're like, I see Brian, Brian, like you just, you just keep on like, yeah, sorry, sorry <laughs> for, for, for stealing the show, but uh, you, you know, the, the, the league director conference, well-timed again, get to go there, steal some good ideas from other leagues as we prepare for next season. Like we talked in the last podcast, Sean, we are in the midst of uh, planning and preparing for that next season. Uh, you want to do that with um, an idea of how you did last season. And uh, so we, we asked our folks in a couple different ways of, of how we did. Uh, the first one I'll talk about is that economic impact survey. Um, incredibly helpful to know how much our folks are spending in the local communities when we come to town for a couple of days uh, across the weekend. So thank you for everyone who uh, participated in that. Uh, I will say that the bottom line up front is we determined uh, across our four events uh, over $180,000 of investment in, in local communities, lodging and gas and food in the local area. And that equates to about $45,000, $50,000 per weekend. Incredibly helpful when the venue team this summer, as they go out and engage with the communities, I'm able to say, hey, we would like to bring an event to your community. Can you work with us on maybe some changing the rules of, a, of the park or, you know, just working with us to, to fit in, so to speak. Uh, and you show them that uh, forty five dollars to $50,000 investment and that gets people's attention. Uh, so thank thank you everyone for who participated in that. Um, uh, according to NICA, uh, the, the best response on an economic impact survey uh, out of all the state leagues was North Carolina. And I think part of that was us communicating it regularly, uh, but I also th think and thank Industry Nine for providing a pretty cool uh, prize set of wheels for the the person uh, randomly selected who did all possible surveys, and that's uh, Yates Farr Henderson Hellbenders. Thank you, Yates, uh, for contributing to to the survey and enjoy your uh, new set of uh, Industry Nine wheels. Uh, pretty cool when you have uh, league sponsors like that, that really, uh, help you out. So again, hugely beneficial. Thanks for doing that. Uh, we can now engage with, uh, communities with some data on, uh, what we're, we're bringing to town. And just on that point, I'll talk a little bit about venue surveys and, uh, the end of season survey. Uh, we are hearing, uh, from the Western teams about finding a Western venue and that's on our to-do list for this summer fall is find a Western venue for this league. So we can, uh, reduce some of the travel time. Uh, if there was, uh, that's one topic in the end of season survey, you know, what could we do better? What could the league do better is reduce travel time. Um, that that's, you know, loud and clear from probably a lot of the teams and just try and reduce some of the travel time to some of the venues. And, uh, we do have that for action. So thanks and for we've that. We've been, we've been looking for a Western venue for every season, pretty much like we, I know that the venue survey crew has been out there, um, 
the the toil and drudgery of uh riding in different venues in western north carolina like really nose to the grindstone doing the work but they have been out there looking just about every summer that that i've been around so i know that that's been a constant thing that's been searched for and we've come close a couple of times and i think we're still um right on the edge of having that venue that that's going to work out yeah, it might be a Nika life truth that there is no perfect venue. And so you have to make some compromises or sacrifices somewhere. Uh, it is logistics a lot, you, you know, the Sean, you know, the parking and fitting 500 plus. And uh, I'll tell you, my, my assessment of this last season to that topic is we were somewhat fortunate. Um, 900 registered uh, student athletes and about 500 was our average to show up. And we like like we talked about, we didn't do caps or anything like Hey, come on. And okay, we fit into some of those places, you know, the, the tricky places I know as much as you like talking about dark mountain, uh, but that, that parking situation is unique <laughs> at dark mountain, uh, to, to say the least. I'm not sure if we had 900 show up at dark mountain, there would have been a lot of people at the YMCA, right? <laughs> a lot of people catching that shuttle, uh, yep. a couple miles down the road from YMCA. Not sure that would have been high on the Stoke factor for <laughs> those, those folks. No. We're, we're working, we're trying, thinking through ways to uh, limit, you know, venue attendance size, um, maybe bye weeks is the plan uh, for that. And, but anyway, we're, we're thinking that through. Absolutely right. Trying to get a Western venue. For and I, and I've, I've been on some of those surveys where you roll up and you roll into a parking lot that can hold maybe 30 cars. And you're like, yeah, this isn't gonna, like, you don't even have to get out of the car. You're like, yeah, this isn't going to work. Um, and that's disappointing because then you go ride the trails and you're like, oh, this is a lot of fun. This would be awesome. But, you know, it just doesn't doesn't have those extras that that we need. Like trails are sort of trails are, are not an afterthought, but there's like a hierarchy of needs <laughs> and trails are there, but they're not the number one there. There's other hierarchy of needs uh, that are higher on the list. Yeah. And we do just, you know, I've, I've spent my first year, I think we talk a lot about community in this league. If you're a lifelong mountain biker, this is all about community. So uh, I've been linked in with a couple trail builders across North Carolina. I'm thinking Ed Sutton, uh, specifically of Trail Dynamics. He built uh, our new trail system out here in Onzo County. Uh, he is approached by a lot of call them venue owners looking to build trails and what do you need out of a trail? And so, you know, we slide Ed the NICA guidance for <laughs> trails, but part of that guidance, just like you said, sort of, I need a couple, you know, acres of parking yeah. uh, to, to fit in. So yeah, we're even catching folks early in that trail design uh, phase uh, so we can build out and a little more engagement um, with some of the outdoor rec agencies here in North Carolina to, you know, long-term, what are we doing? Let's build a venue uh, that can support us. So, yep. That, that's what I think that's important for that, that economic impact survey that you talked about. Like if we can slide that into trail builders and also in this trail design process, say like, if you build a venue that is going to fit for NICA then here's the economic impact that they have. So it helps with the math of all of this, because I know as an advocate for my local trail system, like I'm basically my city said, sure, you can build a trail on, on this piece of, of property. And that's pretty much been the level of support that I've gotten from them, nothing financial. So then I have to go out and get all these grants and things like that to do it. But it would be so much easier if, I was able to go to the city and go, we want to build a trail on this piece of property that you don't have any use for currently. And here's the economic impact that this can have from day one, whenever a Nike race comes here and here's what we need to do it. And that helps them kind of justify starting to put money and budget lines and things like that for it. So that's a, a huge piece to all of this is that the sort of like forward thinking of like, let's start getting towns that are thinking about building mountain bike trails to sort of see accommodating a, a NICA venue as part of their design process and the economic impact that that can have long term. So I, I think it's really important that we kind of circle back and say that these economic impact surveys are going to be really, really important for the growth of the league in the coming years. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you could tie this right back into our uh, team trail core program. If only there was an organization that also took care of the trails that they are, 
are using, and I don't know if I put this uh, stat out before, but Mike Kuhn up in Pennsylvania, lead director there, who has a pretty robust Teen Trail Corps program, reinforced it. Um, you know, most uh, volunteer agencies equate an hour of volunteer work or trail work to about $30 of, of investment. So if you take our 1,800 hours plus of trail work over the season, and it's always a, a danger to do math in public, but about $54,000 of investment, additional investment in local trail systems. So not only if you help build them and we'll help invest in the community, we'll literally invest in the community. We'll, we'll help maintain uh, the trail system. So you see, just like you said, Sean, you know, the full circle aspect of lifelong mountain bike community uh, is really impactful to the state and, and local communities. So, yeah, I think we're on a good path for that uh, in the league here. hundred percent. Um, so yeah, let me, let me talk uh, about the end of season survey. And uh, I've been trying to think through how to package uh, the results essentially, and share that back with the league about what everyone was saying. I think this will be part of it. I'll give a kind of verbal summary of what I saw in the survey and think through how to get maybe something out in the next single track times or uh, to team directors, head coaches, just, uh, you know, here's what everyone is saying. But let me give just a summary overall of the survey, uh, which I equate as, as, as good. One of the key uh, pieces of data I got from the coaches, the parents, and even the student athletes. One of the first questions is, Hey, are you coming back? And over 90% of all those categories said they're, they're going to return to the league uh, in some form or fashion uh, next season. That's a pretty good signal that, you know, they, they appreciate what we're doing. They're enjoying what we're doing. Uh, that that's a key, key fact for me, uh, broad, uh, kind of feedback, um, Pretty much everyone across those groups agrees that student athletes, physical and mental health uh, has improved. Uh, like we've already mentioned, uh, broad agreement that coaches are good at building teams and good at incorporating skills, but some work to be done there, uh, like we mentioned for, for the coach clinics. And then interesting enough, uh, participation costs about right um, across, again, those those categories, particularly coaches and parents, either whether that's coach fees or parents paying for uh, league registration. Uh, interesting enough, there were uh, some North Carolina specific questions this year, and thank you uh, for uh, those that participated and answered those questions. It does help us shape the next season and even the future. On, on the fee issue, uh, about 70% uh, prefer the current fee scheme, which is a, a season fee and then pay by event or pay by race. I'd really been thinking hard about maybe going to one overarching fee uh, for the league. One, just out of simplicity. Uh, two, I know kind of what the money is up front for the season, and I stay within that budget is really, really helpful. And uh, I don't think uh, Hike or I ever want to uh, cancel and issue refunds again in pit zone. It just takes hours uh, to do that. But I'll, I'll think that through, and we'll let folks know before we go into registration September, October with the fee scheme. Uh, will be for for next year. But thank you for that feedback. You know, people prefer the option uh, to pay by race, but from an inclusivity and kind of what we say is like, you don't have to race to be part of this league. And if we're going to expand other league wide opportunities to ride and not just race, um, I don't, I don't see how we just have folks pay for the race. And, you know, anyway, uh, we'll have to think that through, but again, thanks. Thanks for the feedback uh, on that. Now let's, uh, the North Carolina specific answers, um, what I thought was the case. Uh, I was really curious why we had 900 registered student athletes and only about 500 or so coming to the races. So we asked, hey, what, what kept you from racing? And certainly I think maybe 30, 40% answered other commitments. And, and we all know that, you know, our athletes have other sports, they have other activities, uh, you know, families have plans and, you know, that all makes sense. But there was uh, over 20% that said, I, I just like riding. I, I don't, I don't want to race. I, I just like riding. Um, so, okay, got it. And we asked like, what type of things would you want to do? We've been that under adventure in this league, you know, uh, and we tried a couple of those things this past season. The interesting, like the overarching comment, Sean, about like what you'd want from adventure um, other than like anything like, OK, <laughs> anything different. The, the overarching theme was what people value a lot about whatever a league event is, is the connection with other teams and the connection with other athletes across the state. It almost doesn't matter what that thing is. Uh, they part of the disappointment uh, from our cancellations this past season beyond, hey, I trained really hard and I didn't get the race and was I'm not going to see my friends. <laughs> I'm not going to see, you know, my buds uh, from across the league. And so what we'll do is we'll take all this input, whether that's scavenger hunts or there was some calls for additional skills rides, like let's practice skills and session 
and the like. Uh, there was even calls for maintenance, navigation training. How do I find my, you know, you're only lost if you care where you are, but hey, if I got to get back to the start point, like how do I do that? That's all good. We'll hand that over to the adventure committee you mentioned, Sean. Shell, team, chew on that, and then look to incorporate some of those things across the league for 2024. 2024 will be a season of adventure. Like we focused Team Trail Corps, got that off the ground. We'll get adventure up off the ground in 2024. So thanks for the feedback. Um, from across the league uh, on that. But again, a lot of call for let's do something a little bit more for the non-racer student athletes. Let's find opportunities to connect teams and student athletes uh, across the league. And then again, like I mentioned, uh, closer venues uh, came through uh, loud and clear. Uh, even here, here's an interesting stat. I did ask the specific question because we pulled off the one day schedule, John, if you remember, again, let's say dark mountain again. And as often as we can in our podcast, <laughs> uh, you know, we went to a one day schedule and we've got that in our hip pocket. If we have to, uh, go to a one day on a Saturday, because Sunday is just looking like a mess, uh, weather wise, it, sometimes it's hard to shift EMS and everything to pull off a race, or maybe trail conditions are not race ready. Maybe we could do just a ride event and about 63% said, yeah, I'd come do ride for on a one day if you had to cancel. And so that that's a good signal for me that we're thinking uh, the right way about it. And then just a couple other data points about the, the survey, 75% uh, interest in some form of uh, summer camp, uh, you know, mixed day or night camp. Um, but you saw the same type of things, just want to get together with folks. I'd like, you know, some skills instruction, like to go on different rides uh, at a camp. So we'll think that through and maybe put something on the, the calendar for next summer. Uh, for this league, since there seems to be a, an interest in that. And then uh, dare I close on on weather again, uh, about a about, about a 60% call to stay a spring league over over moving to a fall league. I'll, I'll still do some analysis on that. But like we started the, the podcast with, uh, it's over 100 degrees with the humidity here in eastern North Carolina <laughs> this week. Uh, air quality is crap right now. I just I don't know like how I would pull off a practice if I was a coach <laughs> here out east. <laughs> But anyway, really comfortably. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, it's it, it's tough to do uh, in the summer. But but anyway, that that's that's what I saw, uh, Sean, uh, broadly uh, in the survey. And thanks again for everyone who contributed. It does really help. Uh, this is our league. I keep saying that it's our league. Uh, so hearing what you want to see out of it and where you want it to go is going to help me uh, and the, the staff, Sean, point the ship in in a good direction. And uh, just keep the feedback coming. Just because the survey is closed doesn't mean I, I won't take an email or phone call on what you're thinking uh, for about next season, but I'll just uh, put a plug in here, like um, adventure committee, you want to join contact shell team trail core committee, Leonard uh, Van house is he's our new team trail core coordinator. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Join the team and uh, help us uh, help us figure out how we do this. Even uh, we talked last night, I uh, saw on the staff call about forming a race committee. Okay. There were calls in the surveys. How do we make races more competitive, more challenging, particularly for some of our older athletes, Okay, let's form uh, some folks from across the league and give us some ideas on on how to do that. I think that's a good way to to, to go. We do say inclusivity is one of our uh, core values, so that can be us adults too. So there you go. Awesome. And one thing that I want to kind of tag on to this is uh, thank you to all of the coaches that uh, filled out the handbook edition and revision suggestion forms that uh, I sent out to coaches. We are uh, going to be taking those and um, kind of putting them in a um, form so that, or in a, in a document so that our league rules committee can look at them and then kind of tweak and refine and move on to the next process, which is us sending those additions and revisions to NICA for their approval and possible inclusion in next season's handbook specific for our league. So thank you for fill, taking the time to fill that out and share your um, ideas on better ways to improve uh, what it is that we do. Uh, with that being said, um, the only other dates we've got to share are kind of the big ones. So the season opening for 2024, team and coach registration is going to open on September 15th and student athlete registration is going to open on October 1st. Uh, so those are the two dates that need you need to be aware of uh, for the beginning of the season. Anything else to add, Brian? Or are you all talked out? I'm pretty much talked out <laughs> at this point, but I know um, 
I've already gotten pinged uh, a couple times about the dates for next season, the event dates. We've got a draft list. I'll do the initial kind of touches with venues, just initial sense of who's available and what's out there. So I, I suspect within the next months or so, we'll have the dates uh, ready to publish. And kind of the idea with League Summit 7, 8 October is really rolling out the season information at the summit. So come out to the summit. Well, hey, here's dates and venue locations and the ideas on adventure, all that at uh, at League Summit and kind of launch the season uh, with that. So yeah, we're still working on on the dates for next season. It's probably a lot of question on a lot of people's minds right now. Still a work in progress. Yep. All right. Well, um, I guess the moment that you have really honestly been waiting for um, is now upon us and your dad joke. So I'm not going to steal your thunder. I'm not going to make you go first. So I'm, I'm going to go first okay. um, because I don't, I don't have a joke. Um, but it, it struck me today and, and this is honestly not a joke. It's just a, a story, but it is my dad moment. Um, so I was uh, wanting to buy a, uh, a present for my son's birthday and he really loves to build jumps and things like that. So the, the holy grail of building dirt jumps is a buttless shovel. So I'll kind of describe this. So you know how most shovels sort of in the back, it's a folded little piece that the handle slides into and it's like a little dimple and that's called a butt. Well, for dirt jumps, you slap with the back of the shovel and that butt actually kind of gets in the way and it can dig the dirt up and, and it's counterproductive. So a buttless shovel doesn't have that little dimple. It's just a completely flat bottom that you can slap and, and really pack in the dirt. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to get my son a buttless shovel. So I'm like, where do I need to go? Um, let me just do a search for buttless shovel on Amazon. Let me say that never, ever, 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 put the word buttless along with anything when you search for stuff on Amazon. And I'm going to leave this completely to your imagination. And I'm just going to go ahead and warn you, do not try this at home. But the thing that Amazon saw was not the shovel part. And so all the things that I got in my search were like, dramatically inappropriate i think for anybody in my household to be looking at so i was like okay never again will i search for a bullet shovel so i had to figure out what do i put in the in the algorithm so that i get the things that i'm wanting and so i had to like refine my search over and over until i finally was able to find like i'm narrowing my department all kinds of stuff so just uh my dad moment um, which I'm going to turn into a dad joke is searching for a butler shovel on Amazon. So thank you all those Amazon users <laughs> in the algorithm to <laughs> provide some probably pretty colorful search results uh, for Sean. Sean, you could always go the military style, which it w would be, we describe that as uh, shovel comma buttless. Buttless, One. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. And, I, used uh, to, I used to have a jacket and it was like, jacket comma winter. And then it had in the instructions, it said, do not dry in oven. <laughs> and so I was like, well, you know. Oh, well, that was uh, then built for Marines. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fantastic. Butler Shovel, good uh, punk rock band name. Uh, <laughs> let's hope we don't see any team names uh, with that on their jersey. <laughs> well, boy, you could, ooh, you could use a lot with Butler Shovel. Anyway, yeah. So, uh, two days past Independence Day, Sean. So, I wanted, you know, Fourth of July kind of themed uh, dad joke. So, uh, how come there aren't any knock knock jokes about America? I don't know. Because freedom rings, Sean. Freedom <laughs> ring. <laughs> oh, that was that was good and terrible at the same yeah. time. <laughs> That's uh, the highlight of the podcast for me, and I'm sure all of our listeners, <laughs> everyone, that <laughs> joke portion. Yes. Awesome. Well, uh, we'll be back next month kind of with a, a little bit of a preseason kind of podcast. Um, yeah, a little bit of teaser about what we're thinking about next yep. season. That sounds good for next podcast. For everybody in uh, out there, just hope you're enjoying riding. Those of you in Eastern North Carolina, I'm sorry. Um, come West, it's cooler a little bit, a lot. So yeah, plan a vacation out here soon. Yeah, stay hydrated, everyone. Is a woman. <laughs> See ya. See ya, John.